this is something that I think <clears throat> all hospitals, everyone who is in healthcare would be being impacted presently. As this, we are now entering the third month of this uh, epidemic. And I think clearly anyone who is in the healthcare industry would be suffering because not only from the virus, but also, hello, am I on? Hello? Hello? Yes, we, yes, we can hear you. We can hear yeah. you. Uh, well, so, it is, it is, so it's not only the, the virus which is affecting everyone, but I think more imp as importantly, it's going to be how we can sustain this financially. So, Archana, can you flip the chart? Yeah. So, very quickly, this is the index. Uh, I'll spend very brief, uh, just a minute on the, uh, the pandemic, the response of the hospital, the cost of dealing with this COVID, and how do we sustain ourselves during this period of time. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the most extraordinary of times. The, this virus has impacted, I think for the first time in history, every single country has been affected. Even World War II or any of the world wars didn't impact the entire world. This is a time where every nation, every institution, and probably every person on this planet has been affected in some way or the other. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, really, the, the, this virus is impacting the health, and I think that's the most obvious part. All of us are dealing uh, with uh, taking care of patients. So, health is the most important thing at this point of time. It has impacted society and social norms, the way we interact with everyone, the way we are stay at home, social distancing, very, very pro a profound effect. And this is an effect on society which will be there for some time. The impact on the economy and finance. This is probably, to my mind, going to be the most severe impact which we have not seen as yet. But even after the virus is out, we are going to see across the world, the economy and the financial systems in total turmoil. And this is something we need to be aware of. When I say financial systems, it includes the banking systems. And it is important we understand how it will affect the banks because if banks are affected, our entire cash cycle is affected. And this is something we need to be aware of. On the flip side, I think for the first time we are seeing an improvement in the environment. Uh, you can see blue skies. I know in Bombay you don't see blue skies. And we have been seeing blue skies for the last uh, few weeks. Next chart. Uh, can you flip the chart, please? Yeah, uh, if you can uh, put the rest of the slide. Uh, now, this is something. Uh, now, let me give you some of my experience of Holy Family Hospital. I think we were very fortunate that some of the sisters, and including our sister doctor, were very clear in their mind way back, even at the end of February or early March, that this virus was going to have a very, very major impact. It was going to really create havoc across not only the world, because China at that point of time, everyone was aware of, but also in India. And so we, we began planning on the medical side, probably right in the beginning of March. And once we did the planning for the medical side, it was apparent that on the finance side, there would be a lot of pain that we would have to endure. <laughs> So this is something I think, and I know in the Holy Family Hospital, we discussed this at, uh, at our meeting with the sisters. What is the priorities? And one thing that came out very clearly was the first priority in this epidemic is to protect our staff. 
that was absolutely their utmost importance. Then patient care, after we protect the staff, then we have to look at patient care. How do we deal with COVID patients? How do we protect non-COVID patients? How do we treat non-COVID patients? The mission, I know that this was a discussion that came up that, you know, we have a mission and how does COVID play out as far as the mission statement is concerned. But, but finally, I think all of us need to be very clear that our top priority finally is to save the institution. Next, uh, Archana. Yeah, and that is where we have to keep the hospital alive. I know that initially <clears throat> this seemed to be, you know, what, what are you talking about? But I think after two months have passed, it's becoming very clear that this is the utmost importance that whatever we need to do, whatever we plan, the objective should be to save and protect the institution. Yeah, can you open the slide, uh, Arjuna? Yeah, uh, so. We, we set up a, a team of people, it was including doctors, nurses, administrative staff, to really try and determine really what is the cost of dealing with COVID. We knew that we were procuring PPEs. We knew that we were putting sanitizers all over the place. We knew that, uh, you know, we, we were doing so many different things to deal with it. But, but really nobody had a finger of, on how much was the total cost. And this is what we set about probably again almost one and a half or two months ago to detail what is the impact of treating COVID on a costing structure. So what does it include? Pr protection of staff, quality PPEs. Now, as I mentioned, the top priority that we determined was whatever we do, we have to protect our staff, particularly the staff that deals with the COVID patients. So quality PPE is to provide to nurses, doctors, anyone who is involved, which includes suits and masks, sanitizers across the board. Everything was being sanitized. Every person was being sanitized. Every visitor who came in, that doesn't matter. Anyone who entered the hospital had to be sanitized. Time off. Now, once you start dealing with COVID patients, you have to be able to give them time off and be able to keep them in a safe area. So big, co big cost, something which you don't realize unless you start planning for it. Testing, a COVID test costs 4,500 rupees. You have to repeat it, sometimes once, sometimes twice. Preventive uh, medication. So, Again, a lot of people have been put on HCQ and there's a cost to that. Personal transportation. Now, I know in Bombay, we have the situation. We have almost 1,000 people across the city coming from north, south, east, west. The public transport shut down. The trains shut down. The bus service shut down. But to keep going, we had to organize transportation for key people from across the, country, from across the city. Big cost. But again, you need to be able to identify it and account for it. Now, again, critical people, we didn't want them traveling back because, again, going back to your home, going back to a family means you can contaminate them. So we have to provide alternate accommodation for them. Another very big cost. <coughs> Insurance. Now, again, if you want to protect your people, right, this is something that we have been looking at, not done as yet. Providing insurance cover to uh, all the people who are dealing with this. Okay. Social distancing. Patient care. Now, as you do get involved in social distancing, means you are, have to cut down or curtail your regular medical care activities in the hospital. Okay. Mask, one-time linen, especially for COVID patients. Medications, cost of doctors, support, treatment, fever clinics. Okay. Uh, then if you look at premises, 
the hospital included once you start uh, once this epidemic started because of uh, because of the premises you have to restrict a lot of things for instance across the board a lot of the facilities we were offering paid uh, facilities we had to cut down or curtail so that becomes a cost to us continuous sanitation fumigation gate inspection of everyone security disposal of medical waste enhanced housekeeping you can flip the chart archana can flip the chart so really the, the, now the, that's the cost part the cost has gone up but there's a double whammy you can flip again the double whammy is that the double whammy is that while the cost go up very significantly the big uh, problem is that your revenue is going to come down because you are curtailing your healthcare services now reducing cost now again once we realized that you know we were going to be have a huge financial problem we created uh, cells across the hospital every department asking them to look at their own cost structure and you know whether it was maintenance department the laundry department housekeeping you know across the board so each each department was encouraged to meet with the people identify costs which can be cut identify costs that can be reduced and some of these things i've highlighted over here <clears throat> which is uh, some some of the things that we have looked at is you know hr now one of the biggest cost that we have in the hospital is people and this is something it's very painful but we have to take also action as far as as far as possible one of the things that we have looked at is immediately i know in the month once the lockdown started say okay people who are not required stay at home whatever leave you have use up your leave so for two months we have used allowed people to use the leave but the thing is it's become difficult the thing is can you sustain thousand uh, you know a thousand people with virtually no income or this is something again everyone has to look at it everyone has to be compassionate but this is something that one has to look at because this will be your biggest element of cost okay uh purchase department again look at whatever whatever is not required to be boss cut down on purchases okay. discuss with your vendors i know during this period of time there are vendors who are who are open to negotiating who are open to extending credit terms who are open to even reducing cost in some cases so this is something that everyone has to get back to your vendors okay now there are some measures also government has announced for instance the provident fund which was 12% has been reduced to 10% for a period of 6 months take advantage of that talk to local authorities you know now i know again one of the things since we planned early enough we were able to tie up with we were able to tie up with the local municipal corporation tied up with them to start a covid center out uh, you know outside the hospital now there's a certain cost to this but there's also a lot of understanding you can get from the local authorities okay. on on the other side is look at your outstanding receivables you know i'm sure that every organization there would be receivables from patients who have not paid insurance companies who have delayed some tds okay you need to start acting to collect all this money now one of the things that we have found very very important is continuous projection and monitoring of cash flows <laughs> so we we started by i know this is something we started more than 2 months ago we track every day what money has gone out what money has come in and this is a and this is something that one has to be very very proactive and be able to ensure that you always on top of the situation mm. so okay the next slide uh, arjuna 
you can open it now cutting cost is one one item I, again there's a limit up to which you can cut cost the other thing is trying to increase revenues okay one of the things is again once you determine how much covid is costing the hospital you have to try and recover this from patients it's not easy i mean i, I know already there's uh, healthcare is expensive but this is something for patients who can afford to you need to do that government subsidy there's government now i know again in bombay with the municipal corporation there is subsidies you can get on testing there are kits available ppe kits i think again if you tap into the right government source you can get suits you can get protections from the government from the local authorities I, we have to reach out and we have to get this okay donations now this is something i know we have again since we planned early we were able to reach out we did create uh, documents well the very detailed documents reaching out to potential donors and i think we have been fairly successful in raising money uh, so again go back to patients who can afford to help the hospital friends of the hospital and also the government uh again uh, you know th th this is something uh, i i if i can again stress how important it is to plan how important it is to always keep on churning out data because it's only if you plan and if you have data which will allow you to really focus in which direction you you, you should be moving can can you know be you be on top of the situation and probably the most important part i know once this covid started as i mentioned we had to shut down large parts of the hospital because of the scare we did not know how to react but again finally at some point of time one has to start opening up the hospital open up uh, in patients open up a lot of the other facilities open up the lab open up the pharmacy open up in, in patients and out patients because finally the mission is to help patient and finally it's only by doing this we can also increase our revenues okay now i have to give special thanks to our team in holy family hospital as i mentioned it was some of the sisters who were so sure that you know that this was going to have far reaching and it helped us to plan well in advance okay i'm done thank you uh, so much felix you were more or less uh, sharp on time thank you for keeping the time uh, without waste, wasting any further time i will move on to srivastava uh, over to srivastava thank you hey archana can you enable screen sharing for me do you see the right. green button yeah my uh, is most disabled participants screen sharing so tamanna may have to do that um tamanna could you please instruct how to do the screen sharing no she just has to enable it okay i've done it so i have oh. it for you oh, all right you host, so you can do the screen sharing now got it got it yeah. thank you so much go ahead uh, srivastava yeah good afternoon everyone it's so good to see so many of you <clears throat> join in this um, webinar Uh, thank you father for putting this together and uh, mr fernandez for the perfect start to this now um there's been a lot of talk about the kind of impact um i like numbers and every time i heard ceos of hospitals and administrators of hospitals talk about the kind of impact that covid has had i was curious to know how has covid affected different departments in the hospital and so i went and dug into numbers i gathered data from my conversations with people from articles from different sources and i put this together as you can see here clearly covid has been very unkind to some departments in the hospital but it has been all right not too bad so 
the birthing department, for instance, the impact of COVID has actually been not too much. The chronic diseases, for instance, nephrology, urology, oncology, still seem to have almost 70% of their business still coming in. Departments which have gotten really impacted, ophthalmology, for instance, is virtually down to zero. Uh, elective surgeries, which include general surgeries and a lot of other procedures are down about uh, 80%. So clearly, there are few departments which have sustained the hospital, else the total revenues would have been down to zero. So therefore, there are certain areas where people continued to consume these services. Then I chose to look at how has the lockdown <clears throat> impacted the entire hospital sector. So I decided to put some data together of some of the large hospital chains and place them alongside a couple of hospitals from our network. And I also looked at the entire Chai network. I found something very interesting. Now, if you see the first line there, which says all hospitals, right? It says there that there has been a 60% reduction in the volume and a 65% reduction in the value during this period, okay? You look at Apollo hospitals, the rev numbers are down only by about 70%, but value is only down by 13%. Right? which means that their the impact, and some of this was because their average bill values actually went up during this period. So as against the average bill that they were doing, they were almost 30% up during this period. Now you look at two of the Chai hospitals, right? the one here which says Chai 1, the numbers actually went up by 50%. And you look at this other Chai hospital, the average bill value went up by almost 18%, which meant that the impact on these two hospitals in overall terms was far lower than what the entire industry in, you know, experienced. So I put here in a box saying that the Chai network as a whole did not appear to have been impacted as badly as the entire sector, right? And barring Apollo, our hospitals appear to have actually weathered the crisis pretty okay. Why? I was wondering why this is the case. And then that's when I started looking at what is this network all about, right? And then that's when it hit me that this is a truly powerful network and that we must make it count every bit. So if you look at, we've got 500 hospitals across the country, which is more than in any other healthcare system. I put there some numbers. The next largest to us is the ESI. And Apollo Hospital is actually much smaller compared to us. Okay? We have hospitals which are brand names. You go to any city, there will be a Chai hospital in that city, which is in the top three preferred hospitals for people in that city. We are known, <clears throat> obviously, to offer affordable prices. Most important, we are all bound together by a common purpose. Now, the thing is that this is something that all our stakeholders must know. During the lockdown, I have been talking to a lot of people to, to let them know about how powerful the giant network is. And while many of them have heard of individual institutions, they're not fully aware of what this network as a whole is all about. And that is really what I am trying to, to indicate here, that Chai must promote the entire network with greater impact. If we had done that prior, of course, we didn't know this was coming, we, we would have weathered this storm much, much better. And like I say, in every crisis, there is an opportunity. And this appears like a good time for us to take advantage of the crisis to come together and make certain things happen, which will allow us to enhance the brand recall, the brand. Just, not just the network, but all the member hospitals as well. The next few slides, I've got some very concrete suggestions that I want to offer for areas which can help us
to improve our revenue performance. Now, obviously, building financial sustainability means that we must look at the revenue side and then we must look at the cost side. Mr. Fernandez talked about the cost side in great detail. On the revenue side, he talked about things which will really improve the cash flow. He talked about uh, you, you know, improving donations. He talked about collections and you know, recovering cost of money spent on uh, patient care protection, etc. What I'm going to talk about here are really in the area of new services, for instance, which we can offer without necessarily making huge investments to do that. Okay. So I've listed out a few things here, right? And I will talk about each of these in the following slides, right? Just take a minute to look at these six bullet points. Yeah. Now, the fact that we have such a powerful network, the manifestation is really how do we work closely with each other? The good thing about our network is that we have really small hospitals, we have really big hospitals. The question is, how well do we collaborate? Now, collaboration is actually not easy, but it's also not expensive. And therefore, I, I am suggesting that this is a good opportunity for hospitals to start collaborating. I was just finishing a call with one of the world's largest medical devices companies. And he suggested me a solution which can be implemented very easily in our network at very little cost, but something that can impact us greatly. So the key message here is that we must start working closely with each other within the network, allowing primary care to come in at certain point and flow up if tertiary care is required. Likewise, cases that come into a tertiary care institution to flow downwards if primary care is required. <clears throat> Obviously, when hospitals shut down, OPD came to a complete close and inpatient activities got impacted. However, as we start coming back, the natural tendency for a hospital is to try and focus on the inpatient care of their business. My view is that in the years to come, that there is going to be a increased focus on OPD services, given that there is a huge prevalence of chronic disease across. I mean, you know, chronic disease is not just diabetes and hypertension. There are so many chronic diseases that people are dealing with. And there's a tremendous opportunity for us to build OPD services, which target chronic conditions, and which can be delivered on a subscription model. Now, this is a very important element, and I'm happy to answer questions on this later, but a subscription model allows us to care for people in the long term, deliver better outcomes, and therefore convert that into more revenues for ourselves. What I believe will happen is that many hospitals may actually lose their doctors because they are unable to provide the doctors with the required patient load. And therefore, a lot of good doctors will be out looking for newer empanelments. I know that our hospitals already attract the brightest talent across the medical fraternity, but this is a good time for us to try and identify some really busy doctors who are very good in their, in their area of expertise and persuade them to move to our hospitals by offering them a higher level of team-based support, which allows them to do more work via OPD services and therefore make sure that their existing patient flows can also come to our <clears throat> hospitals. The other aspect here is that most hospitals, the way that they engage doctors is doctors are not necessarily on a fixed salary. So wherever that we have doctors who are on a fee for service with a revenue share formula, this may be a good time for us to revisit that 
talk to doctors in terms of what kind of revenue shares make more sense and build a relationship with the doctors where we are able to help the doctors increase their patient flow and thereby increase their revenues, not by taking a higher slice of the fees that they help the hospital to generate. There's been a lot of talk about teleconsulting. Everywhere you look, there are people offering teleconsulting services. Obviously, if patients were unable to come to the hospital, how were doctors available to them? So every hospital was announcing teleconsulting services. There were a lot of companies, technology companies saying that, you know, we'll offer you teleconsulting platforms. Swiggy was actually offering free subscription to a teleconsulting program. And so it became the buzzword everywhere you looked, right? However, our view is that teleconsulting is not telemedicine. Telemedicine is a very powerful tool, but it's an enabler. Teleconsulting is just a platform that allows somebody to consult with a doctor remotely. Telemedicine is much more than that. We believe that this is the perfect time for us to expand our telemedicine offerings. I've listed out some services which are already very popular in the global market. Look at that, chronic disease management infectious diseases management at home, post-surgery follow-ups, mental health services, geriatric care. All of these are very, very uh, potential areas for us to launch telemedicine services. And we must very actively pursue this because not only can we earn revenues, but this will also help us to strengthen the relationships, bring in new patients. And God forbid, if there is a future lockdown. I mean, there are a lot of projections being offered. But if there is to be a lockdown, they will provide us the perfect protection. But even if something like that does not happen, telemedicine is here to stay and we must make complete use of the platforms. <coughs> Obviously, there are certain new services that we must look at offering. Uh, geriatric care is one because geriatric care is in various ways, right? One, the number of people, in the, the older people is growing. The kind of diseases that they are having to deal with is growing. Their ability to come to the hospitals is constrained. And therefore, if you look at all of these situations, it is imperative that we must start providing solutions in this space. Uh, these can, for instance, combine telemedicine platforms, these can provide subscription-based services, but we must have a special focus on geriatric care. The last point here is that as hospitals, I'm not sure that we necessarily like insurance companies because we feel like they're constantly constraining the amounts that we can receive from patients. But I have been talking to insurance companies for the last few weeks and what I find is that there is a tremendous opportunity for us to go and strike relationships with these people. One clearly is a preferred provider network because insurance companies are trying to get standardized pricing for procedures. We can offer them something that no other network can offer. We have scale, we have 500 hospitals, we have 3000 outpatient centers, we can offer the insurance companies a preferred provider relationship which can be mutually beneficial to them and to us because they will benefit from better terms we will benefit from more patients insurance companies also are looking to distribute insurance through our hospitals to the families of patients to visitors who come to see them because that is a big market and insurance companies are looking to distribute more insurance through cost-effective channels. Pharma and devices companies, again, are very interested to partner with large organizations like us and are willing to bring global expertise, which will allow us to create exclusive services, specifically in the preventive healthcare area, which, because it is available only in our network, can definitely help us to attract more patients. So I want to stop here.
uh, with the slides that I have shown. And uh, during the Q&A session, I'm happy to answer any question that you might have. This is the points that I have put out there. Thank you uh, so much, Srivastan, for that beautiful presentation uh, and also keeping the time. Thank you, uh, both the panelists, speakers. Well, now this is uh, open uh, session, uh, open discussion. I have a request. We uh, we started this webinar uh, five minutes late. Uh, if it is okay with uh, the attendees, we can extend this up to 5:15. Uh, if you have any difficulty, you can send a message on the chat. Uh, we'll be happy to extend this up to 5.15, depending upon the number of questions that are coming. So now it is uh, time for open discussion. Uh, Archana, if you have compared the questions, can you collect it so that the panelists can, the speakers can answer one by one. You can keep on asking uh, further questions. Uh, if you start speaking, it will take a lot of time. So please type your questions. That will be easier. Thank you. Arjuna, please. Can you show the questions? Yeah, thank you. How do we manage non-COVID hospitals which demand for more PPE and other requirements as they go ahead for many elective and emergency surgeries, especially in rural hospitals? Who would like to take up this question? Felix or Srivastan, who would like to take this? Uh, Mr. Fernandez, do you want to take this? I, I can't uh, see the full question. Uh, how do we manage with hospital? Yeah, can you can you read it, uh, Felix? Uh, part of it is hidden. Hidden. Uh, maybe your screen. Let, let, let me. Hello. Can you read it now? Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Uh, maybe let me give the example of Holy Family Hospital, yeah. where initially we were not taking COVID patients, but at the same time, we did not know even regular patients that were coming in, whether they were infected. So we had to provide PPEs to quite a few people. In fact, even uh, before patients could enter the hospital, before visitors could enter the hospital, they had to take a fever test and also they had to sanitize the hands. So we had we were providing PPE suits for people at the entrance. And then again, as more and more cases came across the city, we had to keep on protecting more and more people. And that whether it's in the x-ray department, diagnostics, lab, anyone who was coming in touch with patients, we had to keep on protecting them. So even if you're not in COVID a hospital, you still have to protect people who are coming in touch with patients because though the patients may come in for some other treatment, they may still be COVID positive. So this is something which is going to be a big cost and which one has to be aware of. If you want to protect your people, you have to provide them with the necessary suit. Definitely anyone who gets in touch with patients. Uh, thank you, uh, Felix. Uh, there are people raising hands. I will come to you after these uh, initial questions are answered. Meanwhile, please continue to... So I have, uh, Father, I'm actually looking at uh, a question that uh, Archana has not yet put on the slide, but somebody has asked this and I want to answer this. It's yeah, we will come to that. Uh, Archana, can you predict those, the rest of the questions? Yes, Father. 
Yeah. Can you move on to the next question? Yeah. Yeah, what's in this one yeah. specifically? Okay. From your so, side? Um, yeah, actually, it's a, a the subscription model. I, I don't know what the owner subscription model. It's a subscription model, right? Now, there are obviously a, a lot of subscription models around us. Okay. So, today, for instance, uh, you have, uh, say, a subscription to a newspaper. Right, where every day you get a newspaper and you pay a monthly bill for that. Right, or likewise, you have subscription for a magazine where every month you receive a magazine. You can have subscription to say uh, a, a television channel where you pay a certain amount of money to Tata Sky to receive a certain set of channels. Now, in a hospital setting, there are a lot of services that can be delivered on the subscription. Model. I'll give you an example in the United States. There is a subscription model called the concierge doctor. What you do is you pay a certain amount of money as an annual membership to the doctor and you can go and visit that doctor any number of times. That doctor is available to you on email, the doctor is available to you on the phone and in, you know, there is no limit on the number of times that you can access that doctor. The, it's not just the access. Every time you access the doctor, the medical record of that interaction is also built in, which means that at the end of the year, there is a complete history of all your interactions with that doctor that is available. Another subscription model that works very well is for chronic conditions. So for instance, world over diabetes management is offered as a subscription service. So let us say that you have somebody who comes to your hospital is diabetic. You offer that person a program that combines the following thing. It combines access to the diabetologist. It combines access to the nutritionist. It combines some lab tests, etc. And the patient pays a monthly or a quarterly or an annual fee for this. Okay. So there are many examples of this, but it essentially means that instead of the current fee for service, the fee for service is an ancient uh, process. I mean, we've had fee for service going back 5,000 years. Okay. But in the current context, it is not efficient. Fee for service was all right. As long as you're dealing with acute cases, when it comes to chronic cases, a subscription model, will work much better. And I think this is a good time for us to start putting subscription models out there. Primary areas where subscription models would work, like I told you, <coughs> chronic disease is clearly one. And that I think is definitely an area that we found that during this lockdown period, people who had chronic conditions had to continue to manage them. People with acute conditions did whatever, you know, other ways. But if we had had a subscription model to target chronic disease, it would have been to the benefit of both the hospitals and the persons enrolled into the program. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rivastan. I think the next question is also addressed to you. The difference between telemedicine and digital dispensary. Yeah, okay. So, in fact, uh, Archana, there are a bunch of questions. There is a question that... Uh, it, will, it will come, Sebastian. She has put it in the PPT. So... Ah, it, no, no. I, I was just trying to combine because a bunch of questions around telemedicine. Okay. Then, can you, uh, Archana, could you please scroll down so that... Uh, I thought that I could them. take them together. Yeah, answer together. Yes. Yeah. Archana, could you scroll down, please? I'm, or, or if you could clap those questions. Yes, I am putting additional slides because some of the questions have come in later. Yeah. So if I were to answer that particular question, see, telemedicine is is just a, a platform to deliver remote services. Now, remote services can include many things, right? So today, for instance. When you say a digital dispensary, what are you looking at? You're saying 
that you can have a dispensary which has a kiosk where you can measure vitals for a person and a doctor seated somewhere else who can look at those vitals and take action. Now, the use case for this can be anything. It can be somebody presenting with a fever or it can be presenting something with a heart attack, somebody with a heart attack. So today, for instance, I was talking to Medtronic. They have a model where in the remotest place, there is an ECG. The technician does the ECG on that and the image, the ECG is red in a center, which really the way that you leverage the telemedicine platform, right? So which in a sense, this comment which says telemedicine will not have any economic benefit for rural. In fact, if you look at rural and interior hospitals today, without telemedicine is very difficult for you to continue to be because what will happen is if you do not connect using telemedicine platforms to the specialty hospitals in your network, what will happen is that those patients who could have come to you other hospitals. And therefore, it is very important for a big hospital to offer telemedicine service, for a smaller hospital to also offer. But what they will offer is the difference. So a small hospital will use telemedicine to connect with the larger hospitals on the network. Whereas a larger hospital will offer telemedicine to deal with problems that people living in remote areas will face, right? So there is obviously telemedicine is going to be going to pervade the system like anything. It's just a question of how do we use it? And take it from me, every hospital. Right now, the way we have used it has been very limited. But if we do it correctly, every hospital, irrespective of where they are, will benefit from telemedicine solutions. <laughs> Uh, Sivastar, can you see the rest of the questions? Can you scroll down? Uh, uh, so, okay, Archana, can you scroll down? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there's this question which says we have small health uh, centers. These, these are questions which I don't think Sivastar will not be. Are there questions connected with his presentation? Yes, I'm just typing it out. You want me to answer the first one, private hospitals? For yeah, yeah. Felix, meanwhile, yeah, meanwhile, could you answer those questions? It will be yeah, uh, in fact, it is only certain labs and certain hospitals who are allowed to carry out the tests. So it's not that any and every hospital can do this. OK, would you like to answer the rest of the, those three questions? Yeah, the, the second question about uh, patients being scared to come to the hospitals, very, uh, that's de definitely there. It is a big challenge. Uh, but and uh, but I think patients are slowly coming back. I know for the first two months, even though we had the lockdown, in spite of the lockdown, very few patients were coming. Uh, now what what we have done in Holy Family Hospital, we have opened an OPD outside the hospital. You know, we had an open space uh, where we had a cafeteria, a parking area. We have converted part of that into an OPD, so patients don't have to enter the hospital. Now, what we are finding that a lot of patients are sick, they are non-COVID, they want treatment. Probably they stayed away the first month, but now slowly they are coming back. In fact, they are coming back in bigger and bigger numbers. So this is something which I mentioned, the hospitals must find a way of opening up their OPDs. Advisably, not within the hospital, but maybe just outside the hospital, in your car park or in an open area have fever clinics and have the OPD. Okay, thanks, uh, Felix. <clears throat> what about the third question? Uh, 
uh, yeah, that, that's a tough one. Uh, you see, the patient may not be aware of, of COVID, but our hospital, our people, our staff must be fully aware of it. And that is where they have to be protected because any patient that comes in, irrespective of what type of, certainly if he has fever, if he has the symptoms, that is something immediately he has to be segregated. Okay. But again, while checking the patient, even while doing a temperature check, the person who is doing the temperature check has to be protected. So right at the gate itself, the patient has to be checked for temperature. And the person who is checking the patient has to be protected. Could, uh, uh, I think they are also talking about the lack of availability uh, of uh, BPE. We are trying to mobilize some resources. So you can write to, uh, we had actually circulated a, uh, an expression of interest. I hope uh, most of you have filled it. So wherever possible, we'll be able to provide you some support. But it is also the responsibility of the government to support you. So if you have some connection with the local um, the authorities, the collector or you know, the district uh, health officer, get in touch with them. They also uh, should be able to help you in some way or other. In some of our hospitals, they are also approaching other people to sponsor them. People are sponsoring uh, in kind as well as in money. So these are different ways you should, but it's very, very important for you to protect your staff. Without protecting the staff, if they get infected, then your whole uh, hospital that will be closed down, it will be very difficult. So uh, that, that's very important. Somehow you'll have to get the sources from uh, different sources. Can we move on to the next questions? Let me see whether, what are they? Yeah, how do we pay full salaries when doctors are not willing to work? Yeah, maybe Felix and uh, Srivastan, you should be able to answer that. How are you, your experience, yeah. Yeah, I can give you what we've done in Holy Family Hospital. Sure. Uh, initially, in the beginning, there were some uh, doctors who were not willing to come. Uh, we did the same thing with other staff. He said, okay, if you're not coming, you have to take leave. Now, once the leave is exhausted, then that becomes a question mark. And then we wrote to them saying that, you know, your salary would be deducted. That, so that helped. A lot of doctors came back to work. But I think what has also helped is that in Bombay, at least, the, uh, the municipal corporation has issued a tic tac If they tend to work, then they would have to work at the government COVID hospitals. So the moment this came out, almost all our doctors have come back to work. Okay. Uh, so again, you may have to liaison with the government officials, get their confidence because if you are paying salaries, they also have, a, you, uh, they have rights, they also have a responsibility. So they cannot just take salaries and say that we will not work. So we'll have to, you know, yeah, uh, figure out like what Holy Family did or you know, some other ways. Srivast, then will you be able to ask that cost factor of telemedicine? Yes. So <clears throat> actually, if you look at it, I don't know what is the perception around telemedicine cost. Okay? So today, if you look at a low income community person, if you look at it for a person like that, what are all the elements of cost that that person actually incurs when receiving care in the present context? So we run the government insurance programs. And what we find is that to a lot of people, the cost of travel is a big cost. Now you must consider when you say telemedicine, it is about allowing somebody to receive care remotely right and therefore you are saving so many things for that person if you take somebody from a low income community if that person has to come to a health center which is far away they have to spend time in off in many cases they will lose livelihood okay they have to spend on travel and they have to spend on other incidental costs all of which actually get saved when 
you provide telemedicine services okay one second as long as the person who is providing the care is able to build empathy into the relationship it doesn't take away anything at all we are just used to a world for instance during the lockdown so many of us did so many meetings on zoom and we still got by earlier we would have said oh these had to be face to face meetings it is the same way it is about setting the right kind of context it today the other thing about telemedicine is that the amount of data that can be captured during a interaction can be far more than the amount of thing that is spent today so there are a lot of aspects to this which must be looked at when you look at cost so if you ask me telemedicine is a great opportunity for people from low income communities because they will actually benefit a lot from that and as far as the rapo part is concerned it actually can be far more because they can it's like this if you go to see a busy doctor the doctor spends a few minutes of his or her time with the patient how much rapo is possible to build into that so i think that some of these things are changes which must come over us and we must be willing to embrace the change thank you uh, srivastan it is 5 minutes 5 uh, minutes past 5 so we will take only one more question in this webinar however we will be compiling all these questions and we will take it up in the next webinar or we will uh, bring it to you through our help desk the answers so we'll, we'll this is the last question uh, alchana please go to the previous slide uh the budget preparing a budget could you speak something about preparing a budget for the hospitals in the present scenario uh, yeah felix you are a chartered accountant uh, yeah could you speak and then you reverse the something you can also speak on that yes i yeah. think this okay. question preparing a budget in the present scenario very difficult to do my only advice is look at your actuals for the last three months and based on your actuals try and do a projection for maybe the next three months but it can i i i should mention another point see one of the dangers of this present epidemic or pandemic is that nobody knows how long it's going to be there now the last uh, pandemic which was the uh, spanish flu was there for 3 years and it came in four waves now the thing is whether this uh, covid 19 is going to be there for 3 months 6 months 1 year 2 years i think nobody has the answer everyone is hoping that uh, you know there would be some cure or there would be some uh, you know and a lot of research is going on but nobody is willing to bet that that it will take at least 12 months to 18 months before some uh you know something can be found so one of the very big uh, difficulties in being able to do your budgeting or being able to forecast accurately is how long is this covid 19 going to be there well uh can i add to this father yeah please srivast is coming so, uh, i think this is a good time for us to also focus on how can we take costs out so when you're preparing a budget i think it is good to look at every line item in the budget and say that how can i reduce this cost so mr fernand has talked about the broadly the uh, the big items there uh, manpower so it's about looking at saying i've got five people doing this work can i get this done with four people and that is going to be an important part of preparing this budget because forecasting your demand is going to be a challenge but if you arrive at a forecast then planning on saying how much will i spend to achieve this forecast is something that becomes very crucial at this time <clears throat> thank you uh, srivast